This next section begins, is called uh, Monasteries in a Nutshell. <coughs> From early days in the history of Buddhism, there have been those who wished to live a monastic life, but felt unable to withstand the rigors of the peripatetic forest dwelling regime, which had been the norm in the first phase of the Buddha's teaching, Buddhist the Buddha's teaching career. Even during the Buddha's lifetime, monasteries began to spring up on the edge of towns and villages. Many monks frowned upon this development. They felt that such monasteries were situated too close to the corrupting influences of the world. On the other hand, it could not be denied that such monasteries met a need. <coughs> As Buddhism spread throughout India and beyond, the number of monks choosing to follow a more academic vocation was swelled by elderly monks and those too poor in health to live in the deep forest. At the same time, lay Buddhists were desiring to feel the presence of the Sangha uh, more tangibly in their midst. The forest monks were revered for their piety, but seemed too remote. The villagers and town dwellers wanted monks nearby as examples and guides in their daily life, and also to play a more prominent role in traditional ceremonies and the community's social life. Over the course of time, the urban monks assumed an active and increasingly secular role that drifted from the original ideal of the bhikkhu, but was indispensable in the creation of a society that conceived itself as Buddhist. <clears throat> in the mid-13th century, the town of Sukhothai, formerly one of the northern outposts of the Angkor Empire, became the site of the first independent Thai kingdom. By that time, the ancient Mon Theravada tradition, dominant in Sukhothai, had been compromised rather than enriched by its encounter with other traditions. To the dynamic and con conquering ties, the Buddhism of Sukhothai must have presented a rather tired and worn demeanor, a noble tradition that had lost its sense of direction. King Ramkum Hang turned instead to the lineage of forest monks introduced into southern Thailand from Sri Lanka, then the flourishing center of the Theravada world, in order to revitalize the spiritual life of his kingdom. <clears throat> These forest monks were proficient in both the Pali scriptures and the traditional meditation practices. They possessed the purity, integrity, and freshness on which the religious life of a new self-confident Buddhist nation could be founded. The king built a monastery for them on one of the hills overlooking the city from the west, and every lunar observance day he would ride out on his white elephant, head of a large and magnificent procession to take the precepts and listen to a sermon. Through the support of the king and his court, the ideal of the forest monk was exalted. <coughs> Over the centuries, however, with the gradual decline of Sukhothai and the growth and expansion of Siamese power further south in Ayutthaya, it was the monasteries of the towns and villages which came to dominate. As the Sangha's role in society broadened and became more entrenched, so too did it become increasingly institutionalized. Given the immense prestige of the Sangha, it was inevitable that the king should seek to control it. A system of administration was established in which those exerting power were chosen by the king. 
a monastic life became a viable career as well as a vocation. Power, wealth, rank, and fame were now available to the career monk, and periods of corruption in the Sangha alternated with bursts of reform. During this period, temporary spells in the monkhood came to be expected of every young man, and it was understandable that the majority of these short-term monks would prefer to stay in a more comfortable monastery close to home than in a distant and inhospitable forest where they might fall prey to spirits, wild animals, and racking fevers. <coughs> All such developments tended to marginalize the forest monks. From their former preeminence, the forest sangha became an insignificant force. Forest monks were mistrusted by the authorities, feared and mythologized by the villagers, and known for their purported psychic powers rather than their devotion to the Buddha's system of mind training. At the same time, the village monasteries became an intrinsic part of people's lives. The local monastery gave the village its identity, an affiliation with the unseen powers of the universe, a sense of continuity through change. Few of the images that the word monastery is likely to evoke in a Western mind would agree with the reality of a village mon wat in rural Thailand. It might be the, ab the abode of monks, but it was considered the property of all. The path in front of the Dhamma Hall was a public thoroughfare, and the monastery well was used by all the nearby houses. Important public meetings took place in the Dhamma Hall, which also acted as a hostel for passing travelers, and was thus the center for the reception and dissemination of news from other areas. The monastery played a central role in the social life of the village, it was the site for the important festivals that punctuated the hard struggles of the year. With daily, enter with daily entertainments almost non-existent, everyone looked to the lively Ngan Wat or monastery fairs for excitement and fun. Some of the fairs were of specifically Buddhist significance. Uh, for example, those marking the advent and end of the rains retreat and the anniversary of the Buddha's birth, enlightenment, and death. Others, like the Rocket Festival, were of a more earthy, animus character, presided over by the monks and framed by offerings of alms to them. But whatever the occasion, no man would be complete without the entertainments staged in the monastery grounds. <clears throat> Performance by Ma Lam minstrels, stalls of special sweetmeats and noodles, shadow plays, boxing matches, and fireworks. It was a time when the usually strict constraints of Isan village society were temporarily slackened. Alcohol was recklessly consumed, and in the grounds of the monastery, having fun was the order of the day. As for the monks, they were not an hereditary elite. In Thai Buddhism, temporary ordination had long been the norm and constituted a rite of passage for, for young men. It had thus always been easy to enter the monastic life and easy to disrobe. Leaving incurred no stigma. On disrobing, a, a man would be, for, would, be, would be referred to as tit, a respectful title derived from the Sanskrit pandita, or sage. Indeed, a man who had never been a monk was considered immature, literally unripe, and a far less attractive potential husband or son-in-law than one who had spent time in the robes. Customarily, the young men in a village would become monks for the duration of the annual three-month rains retreat period, but sometimes they would remain in robes for as long as two or three years. The result was a fluid monastic community in which a floating element of temporary monastics rubbed shoulders with a core of long-term monks. One of the great merits of the system was that, with every family having members who were or had been monks, 
the close bond between village and monastery was constantly renewed. <coughs> the long-term monks would be few in number. They would almost all have been born and raised in the local village and would thus empathize deeply with the daily problems of the local people. They would take participation in village affairs seriously, sometimes as leaders in public works, projects such as building bridges, or when needed, as the impartial advisor and referee in disagreements and disputes amongst the lay community. Historically, the Wat was the center of learning. Apart from their standing as members of the Sangha, the monks also enjoyed the extra prestige of being the most educated and knowledgeable people in the community. They would learn and transmit many skills, such as carpentry, painting, decorative arts, and tile, tile and brick making. Some monks would be herbal doctors, and some, notwithstanding the pro prohibition in the monks' discipline, the Vinaya, were astrologers. Ideally, at least, it was the monastery's religious role that was paramount. The monks were expected to be, as far as possible, the embodiment of the Buddha's teachings and to inspire, by word and deed, moral and spiritual values. They were also called upon to perform traditional rituals and conduct ceremonies. They would be invited to local houses to chant blessings and sprinkle lustral water during marriages, housewarming parties, in times of sickness or ill luck. At the death of a villager, they would be invited to chant the rather abstract and philosophical matika verses, believed to be the teachings the Buddha gave to his mother in one of the heaven realms following her death. Perhaps most significantly, perhaps most significantly, the monastery was the center for the making of merit, understood to be to be the lay Buddhist's most important religious activity. Merit, or punya, refers to goodness as a force for present and future happiness. A wise person makes merit through acts of charity, a moral life, and the cultivation of peace and wisdom. As a result, he or she leads a successful and contented life, and after death is reborn in a happy realm. Offerings of food and material support for the monastery have always been the most basic and popular form of merit-making. Although individual monks might not always be especially inspiring to the laity, they have been considered ennobled and empowered by the yellow robe they wear, and thus able to act as fields of merit. With the accumulation of merit seen to be the, mo seen to be the most important factor affecting people's present and future prosperity and well-being, it is easy to see why monasteries commanded such a central role in village life. The abbot was usually the most powerful and respected figure in the village, combining <coughs> the prestige of age, position, and wisdom. Very, li very little went on in the village without his knowledge, and nothing significant without his approval. People would consult him on every subject, from affairs of the heart to the buying of land. Kampun Buntawi's wonderfully evocative novel, Child of the Northeast, gives a memorable picture of one such abbot. The young boy Kun goes to the monastery for the first time uh, with his father to see the old abbot, Lumpa Kain, of which he is mortally afraid. They arrive as the emaciated, black-toothed monk is speaking to a group of women. His robes tattered and, quote, tattered and dark with age, the folded cloth that lay across one shoulder, looking like the strip of cloth tied about the trunk of the ancient Bodhi tree in the monastery yard. The women have brought their sick children to be blessed. He bent forward again and blew once more on the head of the baby with the swollen face. Then he dipped his forefinger into a small pot of something black. Five or six women held their children up, and he gently touched their tongues with his blackened finger. 
He cleaned his finger, leaned back against his cushion, and spoke again in his deep, rumbling voice. You people come to me for everything, for mumps. He shook his head slowly. Everybody who wants to become a monk comes to me. That I can understand. But also, everybody whose baby is sick, everybody who is building a new house, everybody who wants to get married, everybody who wants to name a child or who has a red eye disease, they all come to me. You people should think, if I die, then who is going to look after all these things? This year, I'll be 85 years old. He was silent again for a moment, looking at the babies, then la laughed quietly to himself. Oh well, oh well. <clears throat> Lumpa spent four years as a dequat. During that time, he learned to read and write, helped with the sweeping and cleaning of the monastery, served the monks, and gradually absorbed at least the ambience and flavor of the basic Buddhist teachings. His duties were not onerous, and there was plenty of time for play with his fellow dequat. Of these, there was a constant supply, as it was customary for weary parents to send their unmanageable sons to the monastery to be cured of their wildness. Orphans, if there was no relation to take them, could always find a refuge with the monks. Apart from accepting boy boys for spiritual reasons, the monastery was also the local social welfare center. Novice Bullfrog. In the monk's discipline, it is laid down that an aspirant must be 20 years of age before he can become a monk, but that a boy, quote-unquote, old enough to scare crows, can become a novice. Lumpa took the going forth vows in March 1931. He was 13 and could probably have shooed, a, and could probably have shooed off a raiding hawk. As a novice, Lumpa's sturdy frame and bulging belly, together with his resonant voice, earned him the nickname of Ung, or bullfrog. Life carried on in almost the same relaxed fashion as it had when he was a simple temple boy, although wearing the robe conferred a higher status and increased expectations. At least in front of the laity, a restrained demeanor was expected. This was not always so easy one of his fellow novices recalled. <clears throat> Every now and again there'd be an invitation to chant in somebody's house, and he would break into giggles in, in the middle of the chanting. As soon as he started it, that was it. We couldn't help ourselves. We had to join in. Sometimes he'd even start laughing during the meal. He was always finding something funny. <clears throat> Lumpa would spend time every day walking up and down in the shade, memorizing the various Pali chants, the daily service, meal blessings, auspicious verses chanted at housewarming parties and marriages, funeral chants and Dhamma reflections. Such as Adu Wang Chi Ritang Tu Wang Mark. The verse that is, life is uncertain, death is certain, I too will die. He also completed the first of the three levels of the Naktam Dhamma exams. It included sections on the Buddha's life and teachings, the code of discipline, and the history of Buddhism, and provided a sound foundation of the core teachings. At other times, gardening and building projects served to work off teenage steam. <clears throat> Very uh, tense. Um, 
the uh, <coughs> the village monasteries really did not um, like or appreciate uh, Ajahn Chah's presence. And then when we set up uh, uh, Wat Nana Chat, uh, then uh, there was um, almost uh, immediate um, repercussions of uh, <coughs> the uh, it's like the, the, the abbot of, of Bungwai village a monastery was actually Ajahn Chah's preceptor and uh, he really did not like Ajahn Chah um, and um, it's very threatening uh, having a monk who's keeping precepts and vinaya and teaching the lay people to, to what those were and what practice, what was proper practices of a monk. So it's, it, uh, it's very, uh, very threatening to, to, <coughs> to your typical village monastery life. Uh, the uh, <coughs> the monk who was um, uh, in uh, Tungbo, Nonbor, uh, which was the uh, was the other main monastery in the immediate region of Wat Chat, he took a, a very virulent uh, dislike uh, to us. Tried to drive us out. Um, uh, and there started to be these uh, kind of postings of like letters of being put up in public places of, of uh, how threatening we were, how corrupt we were, how we were going to uh, destroy the the life of the village and our where uh, <coughs> uh, introducing awful elements into the into the culture and society and whatnot, and uh, and they got increasingly um, uh, shrill and crude, um, and uh, and then uh, and then he got caught posting one. And, and then, uh, and then the it really came to a head because the villagers who uh, were supporters of Wat Nana Chat and uh, and Ajahn Chah were really incensed. And uh, and Bungwai is quite a especially that was many years ago. It was quite a rough village, really. I mean, there was a good, solid group of people who were uh, practitioners, and and but many of their background were <coughs> were uh, uh, a bit renowned. Um, like I remember, uh, one of the uh, when our early years of me being the abbot, then what, there's a uh, a police colonel uh, started coming and uh, was a very close student, and uh, and he was really uh, praising the, the 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 change that had taken place in Bungwai over the through the influence of the direct presence of the of Wat Nana Chat because it, the, when it was just going over to Wakpapong, then it was. <clears throat> individuals who were motivated, but then with the direct, constant presence of the monastery. Because <clears throat> he, and I remember him saying that, that uh, um, uh, Bungwai was a place where police did not go, uh, or if they went, they would have to go in quite a large group uh, to prevent being beat up and sent home. <laughs> it's really, uh, uh, so they were, uh, and say like uh, my, the driver 
uh, who I had, we had a, we, when we got a monastery vehicle, then uh, the, the person who I chose as a driver, his former, his former occupation was, a, was an armed robber. So, <laughs> so sort of upgraded his livelihood. <coughs> um, so it's, it's, it, it, it's a, uh, so when the, this kind of element of roughness was then focused on this monk, it was really uh, uh, going to turn into quite a battle between the villages. And then Ajahn Chah stepped in, and then with the help of one of the senior monks in, in the city, then there was a, a, a gathering of, of the different monks in the, in the area and, and uh, working out the, uh, this conflict and then and, and, uh, um, uh, that, 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 that ended up being a good uh, way to, that that could be put behind and uh, different suspicions. And, <clears throat> and at least it had to uh, not be fomenting um, um, kind of conflict. And then after that, what Ajahn Chah did was have uh, us as a group go over on, on one pra, uh, every one pra, go and sweep up the village monastery, look after the... He said, now that you're... Uh, I can't do the duties of toward my upachaya, but you can perform them for me. So then it was very skillful uh, because then, you know, he was getting quite old. Um, you know, he wasn't that well liked. He was a pretty grumpy old man. And uh, so then uh, we, we would go and uh, boil water for him, uh, sweep up, clean up around, and, and uh, he really took a shine to us after a while. And, uh, yeah. So that was a, that was a, that was a, a good, a big shift then. So then the, uh, <coughs> the village monks were, were uh, you know, slowly became, warmed up to us. Is that the monastery that's still sort of across the way, like on the main Bindapat route? Yeah. That yeah. Yeah, that's a, uh, that's a very old... I mean, it's been around for a long time. <clears throat> Who knows how many generations. Because even the, uh, say, like the, 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 the main sala there, I mean, there's a boat, uh, Upos at the hall, that's somewhat new, but the old sala... Uh, was probably built 60, 70 years ago. Uh, it's built from uh, in the days when there were still forests around there. And it was built all out of uh, uh, a hardwood that uh, uh, Tekian, which is uh, it's a very good hardwood. And, and uh, it's what in, traditionally in Thailand you'd make bridges out of. Uh, it's, it's a very beautiful wood, but it's also... Yeah, very strong, very re re resilient, um, and to to the elements. So it's a, so it's a very good sala. <coughs> Before the uh, reconciliation, yeah. yeah, how did you get like in the beginning? How did you work out things like think about roots into the village so that they weren't confrontational and competitive with the uh, one? Um. I imagine all that we did was was just ha uh, ask the villagers to uh, to sort of advise us what, what would work out. Because we would, we yeah. We, we, yeah. I think that's probably how it worked. You didn't have to uh, get into any kind of discussions with the monks from the other. Monks. No, no, no. 
Do, do you Not think, that I know. Yeah. Luke Ford, do you think part of the tension was because you were competing for resources from, from the villagers? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. That was, that's that's that was totally really, what it's about. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this is this is not a religious dispute. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't <ideal. laughs> Yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't, yeah, it wasn't <laughs> an ideological. <laughs> <laughs> Far more fundamental. <laughs> Even like in the so like after a while, it's, it sounded like Mumpa Cha kind of became took on that kind of role for villagers in terms of advising and helping people, um, you know, with their daily decisions. Or, you know, so <coughs> yeah, I mean, it's always I, I say tr traditionally, it's always been a. Um, a role that the in in Thai society and culture that that they would be looked to, um, and then especially somebody like Lung Pa, who is uh, both um, wise and learned and uh, and uh, uh, yeah respectable, it would be even more so. <coughs> Did that happen at Nanachat? Oh my gosh, yes. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah, it's, it's like, uh, to, to, like, for me, living here in America, it's, it's, a, uh, it's like, there's nothing much for me to do, really, you know. <laughs> no, it's just... <laughs> You know, I actually have my own time and, and uh, get back to my good day. Yeah. <laughs> well, boy, this isn't exactly related to the text, but um, <coughs> I was reading the um, Five Means of Dispelling Distracting Thoughts mm -hmm. by the Buddha, and uh, the first one of giving attention to a virtuous object, I think I understood this returning to the Kamatan, um, but I'm not sure about that one. The second one, about examining the drawbacks, I think I understand. The third one about ignoring, I think I understand. But the fourth one about stilling, I definitely don't understand. Yeah. So what's, you know, <laughs> <laughs> is there any, uh, any thoughts on those, the first and the fourth? I'm a bit confused about them. Well, I mean, one, I, there's lifting up a, a, a more uh, p pleasing object, more wholesome object. Uh, I mean, that's, that, that's pretty, Straightforward. I mean, if you've got thoughts of thoughts of lust or, or distraction, then you lift lifting or of irritation, or then you're lifting up something that's that's wholesome and skillful, and and that the, the image of the of the knocking the the, pay, the carpenter knocking the the peg out uh, uh, is is an apt one. Uh, the uh, the stilling is is one of of taking and I think it's uh, this is really helpful like mindfulness of breathing. Oftentimes we try to either mindfulness of breathing, mindfulness of the body, something that is soothing, settling, uh, being able to to s still the uh, the turbulence of the of the mind rather than. Uh, getting in there and wrestling with it, or trying to figure it out, uh, intellectually conquer it through your your superior logic. <laughs> so good. we're working with like the body energies for that one kind of. Yeah, thing. yeah, yeah, yeah. So something that's that's much more settling, still, or taking a, an object of. Uh, uh, that is uh, uh, pleasing in the sense of of, of soothing in, in a different in different ways. <clears throat> and, and how does um, thank you? And, and how does the the first one differ from number three of it just ignoring? Because I would assume ignoring would uh, imply going back to your meditation object, anyways, kind of thing, you know. Well, you can you can do all sorts of things to ignore. Um, but uh, you know, it's just not getting caught up in it. Whereas the first one is uh, is is kind of proactively lifting up something that, that is uh, pleasing.
pleasing to the to the mind. And love boy, sometimes things are really sticky and yeah. they won't they won't go away for a couple of days or yeah. months or years, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> so Yeah, or lifetimes. Yeah. Or lifetimes. Okay, so <laughs> <laughs> that's your answer. Thank <laughs> you. That's, that's, that's why, why patience is so important. That sense of, of just sort of seeing it's, oh, this is, this is just is a distracting thought. This is a, a, a habit pattern. This is a, something that is, is, is not helpful for my well-being and my peace and sort of being able to keep seeing it and reflecting on it in that way. And then taking one of those object uh, methods of, you know, lifting up, soothing, uh, seeing the, the danger, seeing, you know, being able, okay, this I've been there, done that, seen this, I don't know how many times. I'm just going to set it aside and stick with my, my object, ignoring it. So there's uh, just keeping to, to recognizing that uh, despite the uh, intransigent nature of some of our, um, yeah, our thought formations, uh, that uh, they actually are impermanent, <clears throat> and putting in the the uh, the causes and conditions for them to to shift in a in a wholesome way. So sometimes, I mean, it's so strong. <coughs> it's just so obvious. Well, this is suffering. This is yeah. suffering. This is dukkha. This is dukkha. Yeah. And then ten hours later, this is still dukkha. The next day, this is still dukkha. Yeah. It's the same dukkha. Well, yeah. kind of different, but the same. Yeah. 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 And then you just keep going. Yeah. 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 Okay, yeah. that's what I thought. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard. <laughs> I, I may have read or heard recently one teacher sort of saying that, like, I think it was more like, a, like in a shorter context of like meditation where if something comes up and, it, and you use one of these sort of skillful means to redirect attention and it goes away, then that's okay, keep going. <clears throat> but if it's something that is really persistent, um, this teacher was maybe, I forgot who it was or where it was, but they were suggesting taking more of an analog, like a more of a panya approach. Mm -hmm. So that if it is more recurrent, instead of trying to ignore it and putting it is that, is that something that you would recommend? Or? It depends. Well, yeah, you have to really see what works. I mean, this is where, where uh, um, there isn't really... A, I mean, there, is, there are certain guidelines, but there's no absolute textbook that's going to... This is, if you do this, that's going to happen. Um, you really have to pay attention to what the result is and then be willing to... to Experiment and 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 tweak it a little bit, or and you, this is also where uh, you have to be a little bit creative in engaging in that process oneself, rather than again trying to uh, find. I mean, we, obviously, one relies on the advice the Buddha gives or the advice that the Krubajans give, but. Then one also has to, on a certain level, own it or or uh, take responsibility for it, so that then you're 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 being willing to experiment and 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 see well what actually works uh, in this situation for me, and and uh, and then uh, being a bit creative sometimes of of. Uh, um, it's either using imagery or using, using a, uh, a uh, you know, some kind of phrases that seem to stick, or or just uh, um, throwing one's hands up and say, "Well, okay, what's going to, what's going to happen now?" And, and just taking an interest in it in that, in that way. <clears throat> Long point, you said that um, 
when you come across like a certain like a uh, train of thought um, that you like to exaggerate it somehow mm-hmm. like and you, I think I heard I remember you saying that you use like a certain like uh, like a like a sports commentator like his voice yeah who uh, I can't remember maybe Howard Cosell <laughs> <laughs> No, it's just, you know, because sometimes, you know, just making it absurd where it's, it, you know, just getting, because we take our, uh, me and my problems so seriously, me and my mind so seriously, and then just going with a, yeah, like a, uh, 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 kind of, you know, I mean, Howard Cassell is a good sort of, you know, that, that kind of voice and sports commentary on what the mind is doing, and then it just becomes, Absurd, and and that's then it it, it, it breaks it up. It, 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 uh, uh. <laughs> <clears throat> so, have you ever uh, worked with uh, kind of like uh, when whenever you're breathing, you ever feel like there's some tight tight spots sometimes, or like kind of unevenness? Yeah. Have you ever worked with that kind of uh, yes. kind of like more more even? Yes. And, uh, what what have you found that? Uh, works for you? Well, I, a lot of it is, is uh, uh, I get a lot of it is, again, patience. And then, and then really tuning into both the, it's like, also it's like a pro, approaching it from a place, because uh, usually what we're trying to do is get rid of the tightness and, or the discomfort. And to approach it from a, a, a more of a, a like, like a place of oh, what can I give to myself? It's like giving oneself a, a, a feeling of ease and spaciousness and softness, rather than trying to uh, annihilate the discomfort that one doesn't like. And you know, and and one has to pay attention to the. To that, because there's because the, so often we, we 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 come from a place of aversion and fear, and and uh, like it's like it's always going to be this way. I'm always going to feel uncomfortable and tight, and uh, and but then approaching it more from a place of of uh, oh, I have the opportunity to give myself with each in breath. An out breath, a sense of spaciousness or softness or soothing, a soothing quality, and finding it in each, in each breath and spreading it to the body in different ways. Because it's so easy for the mind to hone in on what's uncomfortable, and usually that's not there's not that much in our body that is is uncomfortable. I mean, it's there. But it tends to take over, and and then, um, but then going to a, a, a acknowledging that, but then also saying, okay, there's, I can bring a sense of ease elsewhere, and then allow that to spread. <clears throat> uh, some sometimes I I have. Uh, like like if I'm if I'm going somewhere like if I'm leaving my kuti or or how in the world I'm going to a friend's house or whatever that there becomes like a, a point just before I leave that what if I'm forgetting something mm-hmm. that I might need mm-hmm. and I feel like that the sense of of uh, anxiety around that like a, the, the the future not being perfect or whatever I feel like that's like a a certain like sense of the unknown, fear of the unknown, yeah. uh, is is there, and I feel, um, but it's hard. It's hard to uh, to uh, uh, remember that the future is kind of always always unknown. Yes, and I'm I'm wondering uh, if you have any um, uh, <clears throat> advice on how to like kind of cultivate that the sense of the unknown. Yeah, well, I mean, I think that that's uh, you know, to, one is to to really acknowledge that. That, that sense of yeah, anxiety, fear, 
just because usually we go to the content and then it'll usually shift and change and then we're finding something else that we're fearful about or worried about or unsure about and uh, but to to come back to that that underlying feeling and sort of okay this is actually fairly consistent and pervasive and and uh, so then just going to that feeling of 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 fear or anxiety and and bringing it into the body and then relaxing it there so that one can move into the next moment or the next event or the the next circumstance uh, from a place of 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 kind of ease and and uh, and bringing a certain sort of clarity and confidence into the into that. so a lot of it is is relaxing I mean it's usually right in the pit of the stomach <laughs> so that that being able to <clears throat> uh, 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 just centering attention in that way and then letting letting that be a place of of confidence and clarity and then moving from that place. <clears throat> well, poor, I guess it's another question about the unknown. It, it made me think about it. I'm not sure, but I, 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 I sort of maybe think that you, you might be comfortable with dying, uh, more comfortable than me at, at this stage. I think we could probably... Yeah. Better, fair. Yeah. Well, I'm on uh, <laughs> I'm, 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 a fairly, I'm, fairly good wager. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but, but I mean, I, I, I ask it that way because I mean, I'm, I'm really not. I really have a fear of death still. It's so strong. Mm -hmm. And having, having, like most most humans do. But yeah. you know, uh, but you know, having very close people to me, seeing seeing them die. And uh, and going through it more, and and you know, the older that I get, I, I think, wow. I I think more people get more comfortable as they get older, but I just I don't know when that's going to happen for me. I don't really see it, you know. Right. And I guess that I I expect a long, bright practice. I hope some of it comes, you know. But I saw people, you know, in my family, my grandfather and his, you know, aunts and uncles into their nineties. Yeah. They were so comfortable with dying. They were like, oh, I'm ready to go. Any day, I am so ready to go. And they were so sincere about it. Yeah, it's and really often, amazing. well, I think that, that especially when, at a certain age, it starts to look really good. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, my, my aunt turned 100, and I went to her birthday, and she was like, I can't believe I'm still alive. <laughs> <laughs> and then she made it to 101. Yeah. And I went to her birthday, and she said the same <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I still, you know, I have this doubt. You know, there's this, you know, rebirth and all this. And, and I, mean, I'm, I was raised Catholic. I talked to you about this, but yeah, you know, I'm still working through all these things. I'm uncertain. It's okay. I'm still doing the practice, but um, there's a question here somewhere. <laughs> I apologize for my therapy session with my boyfriend. That's what habits do, isn't it? <laughs> the trash can uh, the metaphor comes back. No, but really it's more, how does that come? I guess that's just gradually more comfort with, with the Yeah, unknown. it's, it's, it's being, being willing to, willing to, 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 to sort of, Oh, this is unknown. This is I don't know. I'm not comfortable with it. It doesn't mean that that um, one is trying to push it away um, and, and ignore it. But it's sort of it's just, okay. This is this is unknown, and just being able to okay, this is this is dukkha, and and being able to bring. A, a sense of okay, why? Do, what? Where does that tap in? And it's all, and it's always around that sense of me. And so that being able to to acknowledge and recognize, okay, oh, oh, there's that me again, and it's that me that's vulnerable. And and it doesn't mean that one goes into some kind of um, 
you know, extended nihilistic uh, analysis of trying to uh, get rid of anything, but it's, it's kind of, oh yeah, this is this is dukkha, and and it's that, and it's when there is a, a certain awareness and willingness to be present, and just that that well, they're coming back to what Ajahn Chah and is that. Just knowing and letting go, you realize the power of that, uh, to be able to just keep knowing clearly and then releasing, relinquishing, uh, and and uh, uh, and acknowledge because there's always an opportunity to to recognize when there are uh, situations or people or circumstances where one comes in contact with. Some change, some some separation, some death of some sort, some sickness, and uh, to to not skip over that uh, and and try to push it away. And as one c- keeps seeing that and and observing it, and then but then also recognizing the the power of this just this quality of of. Uh, of knowing and being present with awareness, the one who knows uh, that yeah, there's a there is a a timelessness there. Uh, there's a deathless quality to it uh, that that is is isn't really bound by by personality. And and as we just. Uh, uh, and if you try to think about it too much or try to pin it down uh, intellectually and, and what, then it'll you know get complicated again. but it's just that recognition that there are, oh yeah there is something that is is really within this quality of 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 knowing awareness or having a refuge of of uh, 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 of, of wisdom and compassion that these are these are actually timeless qualities that aren't bound by by personality, and that that that's that's a real refuge. Everything that one takes as as what that's got that label and and flavor of me to it is is always going to be se- there's going to be separation and and death, and uh, and that that. Uh, uh, and there's a, there's you know an inevitable sense of fear because of that <laughs> discomfort. So I'd say, uh, but it's a slow process, and that's I mean that's one of the I mean one of the benefits of of uh, um, you know being in a, have the just the good fortune of being in a monastery from the time I was quite young, and uh, and then um, being in circumstances where. Um, yeah, you're, you were, Wat Nana Chat is, uh, cause that's where I spent the majority of my time. Wat Nana Chat is a, a, is a charnel ground. So seeing uh, death of people who you had contact with uh, or their relatives and, and also seeing how, how, how those people relate to death. <laughs> And uh, you know, sort of realize, oh, there's a whole other way of of, of doing it, uh, and uh, I'm quite, uh, um, um, and, and, you know, and, and in both ways because I remember one time, I was early years, I think it was probably the third year or whatnot. I think Lopez had already gone to England, and. Uh, I think it was the first year that that uh, Ajahn Pabakro was the was the abbot, and uh, one of the uh, one of our villagers was drunk, and uh, um, he uh, uh, going home, and uh, managed to turn right in front of a tour bus going to Bangkok. Um, Perfect timing, full speed. Poor bus driver didn't 
didn't have, you couldn't do anything. You just hit him smack dab in the middle. So uh, pretty uh, uh, mangled. And they brought him to the monastery and we ended up cleaning up the body. It was, it was a mess and, uh, and prepared. But most of the villagers really couldn't be around. It was too, that was, that was tough. Although there was, and Pos Om was, was, it was Pos Om was about the only, the only one. I think there's one other, one or two others maybe, but everybody else was. That was just a bit too much. And then, uh, uh, yeah, Ajahn Pavaka and myself. I think there might have been one or two others, <clears throat> but we we uh, cleaned up the body and got new. It's hard to get him in getting pants on again because uh, it was just so many broken bones. <laughs> Uh, but it was, was so seeing things, because uh, everything's out in the open. Um, or going to the hospital, and like one of the things that uh, I, I had done as a younger monk was, uh, you know, if there were monks who were uh, in hospital, then, then I would go and give a hand. Uh, help help look after them, and uh, I was helping looking after uh, one of the monks, and uh, so I was at the hospital, and then a uh, um, um, one of the uh, as a Anagarika from a branch monastery came, and. Uh, to the hospital, and they, they 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 came. I was in the monks area, and they was in a like an emergency ward because uh, he was uh, a cerebral malaria, and he was really he was looked like he was dying, and uh, and he did die later that night. But we were with him the whole time, and uh, uh, see, uh, Ajahn Chah came out to. Because uh, they'd sent word to Ajahn Chah as well, he came out and went, and and he came just at the time when his heart stopped, and they did this whole uh, getting him going and you know, pumping the stuff, and Ajahn, and and his his heart started going again, and, and that happened a few times, and he ended up you know dying about three in the morning or so, and we ended up. So anyway, just you, you have these very direct uh, contact with, with uh, you know, living and dying. Vajan Chah sort of uh, remember him uh, after standing and watching and being present there. Um, um, it's not like America where it's an ICU unit and nobody can go in. Uh, it was a, more like a critical care. It was a big. It was a ward, and <clears throat> and then, uh, but it was a you know, critical care. Because also when it, when he finally, the last time he finally died and couldn't be re resuscitated, then um, there was we were starting to clean him up, and there's a board that you put underneath so when you pump him there. And, uh, and the nurses come running, you know, get the board, <laughs> take the board out and give it to them because somebody else was conking out down the other end of the of the ward. <laughs> so it was. Uh, but Ajahn Chah was he, he, he was he was very watching and watching and then stabilized and then and then he was uh, so okay. Let's get back to the monastery and. Collect some firewood. Get ready for the cremation. So that was uh, that was very matter of fact. <clears throat> the, the first time I was at Wapananasha, they cremated the body of a young woman there, uh -huh. and uh, the the family who was there was very comfortable with all of the the lay people who were staying there, going and looking at the body for contemplation, or, yeah. and I remember no. They're very, no one was crying or, yeah, just very matter of fact, sort of, with the, with the ceremony and everything. 
Yeah, I mean, one is, one is, as I say, it's, it's, everything has been out in the open since they're, they're very young. And two, there's a, a, a very strong support network of family, friends, um, the, the culture around, so it's very, very supportive. Do you remember a moment where you thought, oh, I'm ready just to go back to nature? Do you remember? Was that, did that ever happen for, for you? Like a feeling, or was it more just sort of a gradual comfort uh, with contemplation? It's, it's both, because, I mean, you have a, you, you know, you sort of have that kind of insight. And, uh, and, and then, you know, the, the, uh, um, the and then it, it gradually... I mean, one, it, it, and then um, you know, the the actual attachment is much deeper than, you know, kind of a uh, kind of an insight, you know, and then and then you see it again, you see it again, and it, it keeps you keep releasing. <laughs> okay. <laughs>